Okay, so if Darwin's idea of infinitesimal gradualism, the idea that absolutely everything that exists in life already existed in a very crude form in the first life and that all natural selection had to do was refine, if we can safely reject that, and we can, because you look at all these things in life, there is no way they all existed in the first form of life. Simple bacterial cell couldn't have had all the things that all life has. So that gets rejected. It leaves us with the conclusion, the definitive conclusion, that there really have to be actual origin events in the history of life, that there have to be first times that a certain thing appears in working form, that, a, that an invention and innovation appears and first confers benefit to its possessor. And that has to happen millions and millions of times to explain all the millions and millions of remarkable things we see in life. So if there are these genuine origin events for each of these new inventions in life, what is it that takes responsibility for them? What is it that causes them to happen? That's the whole question in biological origins, not just the question of the first origin of life, but the origin of all these inventions that need their own explanation. Well, the answer has always classically been natural selection. Uh, for example, Richard Dawkins in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, calls natural selection the blind watchmaker. It's something that makes things like watches or even more remarkable than watches. And it does it with absolutely no intent and no foresight, no ability to conceive. Natural selection, according to Richard Dawkins, is what does the invention. But if you scratch your head and think about what selection means, it can't actually invent. Just think about how we use the word in the English language. Selection is to choose among things that already exist. Imagine you've had dinner at a nice restaurant and they roll the dessert cart by and they ask you to make a selection from the dessert cart. That only makes sense because the desserts are there. You can select what's there. No one would roll an empty dessert cart by and ask you to make a selection as if you could do some sort of selecting of things that aren't there and make them appear. That's complete nonsense. Likewise, in biology, natural selection is a real thing, but it is a real selecting of things that already exist, which means it can't have produced the things. They're already there. It's simply selecting what's already there. Now, this is so obvious. You would think that people realized this all the way back to Darwin's book in 1859, and I'm sure they did. The earliest actual record that I can find of somebody writing something that was critical of this goes back to 1887. It was a man named Edward Drinker Cope who wrote this back in 18, 1887. The evolutionists attempt to explain design and structure through the operation of the Darwinian law of the survival of the fittest. It is justly urged against this reasoning that it attempts no explanation of the origin of such structures. So right there in 1887, only five years after the passing of Charles Darwin, you have in writing someone saying, there's actually no attempt in this theory to explain the actual origin of the things that become fixed through natural selection. Years later in 1904, there was a phrase that was coined that became kind of attached to this problem, and it's called the arrival of the fittest. Hugo de Vries in a book in 1904 wrote this, natural selection may explain the survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. It's a great phrase. Natural selection explains how the fit survive, but it cannot explain how they arrive in the first place. That phrase now has been repeated as kind of a catchphrase every time someone wants to refer to this major hole in evolutionary theory. There's a book that came out by Swiss evolutionary biologist Andreas Wagner in 2014. The title of the book is Arrival of the Fittest, Solving Evolution's Greatest Puzzle. And in that book, he says, natural selection can preserve innovations, but it cannot create them. It's the same problem, the problem of the arrival of the fittest. Now, in my book, Undeniable, I refer to this problem as the gaping hole in evolutionary theory. Why do I say that? Well, the whole thing it's supposed to explain is origins. And if that's the one thing it doesn't explain, there's nothing but a hole. This is not just a small gap or some small thing to be filled in. It's the whole thing that's missing, a gaping hole in the theory. I describe it this way in chapter seven of my book. By the time selection begins to favor an invention, something other than selection has already invented it. This is one of those common sense gems to be treasured an obvious realization that gains revolutionary status for no other reason than a long tradition of ignoring it. Let this soak in for a moment. Despite all the grand claims, everything from the popular plea of Richard Dawkins, the blind watchmaker, to the technical pitch of Graham Bell's 
selection, the mechanism of evolution. The very logic of natural selection assures us that the power of invention resides elsewhere. And because evolutionists have never agreed on what this elsewhere is, the gaping hole that has always existed in the middle of evolutionary theory is still there. So there you have it. The main thing that it's supposed to explain, a theory of origins has to explain origins, and it doesn't.